From volunteering to voting, civic engagement is vital to building strong, sustainable communities. We look at the biggest issues facing South Florida residents in ways you can make a difference. Stay with us as we dive into your South Florida. Hello and welcome to Your South Florida. I'm Tony Doris, editorial page editor for the Palm Beach Post, filling in for Pam Giganti. This month, as Americans celebrate the 245th anniversary of the founding of our nation, we're exploring the importance of civic engagement. Defined as promoting the quality of life in a community through both political and non-political ways, civic engagement allows people to see themselves as a member of a larger social fabric with a greater responsibility to help solve issues in their communities. As part of our most recent virtual town hall, I was joined by representatives of some local nonprofit organizations to take a deeper look at the issues facing our communities and ways you can help make an impact. Let's meet our panel. Joining me is Robert Boo, CEO of the Pride Center at Equality Park in Wilton Manors. Kwana Staffney, Executive Director of Bahama Village Music Program in Key West. And Lauren Para, Director of Public Affairs for the Miami Foundation. Let's start by looking at the meaning of civic engagement. Most people just think of voting or politics, but it's more than that. Lauren, explain what it means to be civically engaged and talk about why it's important for the Miami Foundation to invest in civic engagement through its leadership programs. We get that question a lot. What does it mean to be civically engaged? But really civic engagement boils down to promoting the quality of life in your community. And that can be both through political or apolitical, non-political processes. Really, it's about finding what issues matter most to you as a resident and finding ways to act on those priorities. At the Miami Foundation, we invest and in support in civic engagement because we know that communities are their strongest when resident voices are centered and when those resident experiences are valued. That's when we solve problems. That's when we find solutions. And those solutions tend to work not just for some, but for most. Before we continue, the Your South Florida summer intern team went out to hear ways residents are engaging in their communities. I'm Marco Olmo and I'm from Miami, Florida. I take part in setting up this farmer's market here and this farmer's market is a big service to our community. You know, we do employ uh, local homeless people on the street to help us set this farmer's market up and we use a lot of locals and you know, this is like a local outdoor health food store so this is a big service to the community and I'm happy to partake in it. My name is Bruce Oville and I'm from West Palm Beach, Florida. When I was living in Tallahassee uh, for undergrad and graduate school, I was very active in our community there, um, being a part of teen centers and making sure that we're going into uh, underdeveloped neighborhoods and learning about those teens, understanding what makes them unique, finding ways that we can make sure that they remain on the correct track and um, essentially investing in them emotionally. My name is Zoila DeLeon. So I am active in my community. I'm not as active as much as I'd like to be due to um, the virus. I uh, usually email like my representatives through the like, ACLU, the Florida division, whenever there's something that I disagree with. I, back in high school, I did tutoring and volunteered with a couple charities. Um, and in the future, I plan to continue volunteering in college. My name is Michelle Collins and I reside in Kendall. Currently, yes, I am active in my community. I am a part of my prison ministry. And so pre-COVID, we would go in once a month ministering to the women in maximum lockdown, you know, providing them support and encouragement for their journey. I believe it's important so that they don't feel that they are forgotten and that we can go and sympathize and empathize with them while giving them some hope. My name is Brian LaFortune. I live in North Miami, Florida. Within my four years of high school, I advocated for change within my school's environment. This year, I am starting an internship with the Commissioner of Miami-Dade within District 2. So I believe civic engagement is very important for both myself and those around me. 
We see there are plenty of different ways to help address issues in the community. Robert, what are some of the main issues you're hearing from residents and how is the Pride Center helping to keep them informed and active in the community? So the, the Pride Center at Equality Park, one of the silver linings of the pandemic was that it helped us expand our online reach. All of our services and programs went um, virtual uh, by the second week of the pandemic, which allowed us to expand our reach uh, throughout all of South Florida, Florida, and actually all across the country. And so civic engagement within our community runs a, a whole spectrum of fighting for equality and ensuring that the LGBTQ community is represented, is protected, and has the same rights as everyone else within our community. And, um, and then when we specifically look at some of the other issues that are going on, uh, HIV is uh, still uh, Broward County and Miami-Dade County are the number one and two counties in the nation with new HIV uh, conversion. And so we really do try to uh, do a lot of outreach and educate people to ensure that they are aware of this because there are many times that uh, parents do not know that. And so uh, we have, um, and one of the photos that you just showed is we also were a pop-up site for the COVID vaccination for a number of times. And so we have tried to keep engage with the community, keep the conversation going, and hearing what they have to say. Kawana, many of us have visited Key West and the vibrant neighborhood known as Bahama Village. Give us a little history on the area. What are the bigger issues facing residents and how are they impacting your organization? Well, Bahama Village was established by the Bahamians in 1800s. And it is, as I like to call it, the last real part of Key West. It is the culture, it is the vibe, it is the pulse of the community. The community has adapted to the food, to the music, and to the traditions. I grew up on the streets of Bahama Village, and when they say that it takes a village, they mean it. And back then, it, it held resonated, and it still does today. We use the Bahama Village music program to rejuvenate and revitalize and keep that value at the forefront. We are trying to make sure there at the Bahama Village that we honor the culture, that we continue to pass it on to generations to come, that we make others aware of the generation, of others of the next culture, whether they be from Russia or from Persia or from Cuba or where have you, because this has turned into a multicultural neighborhood. It has transcended so much. And so we just make sure, though, that the roots are there. And the only issues, the main issues with us is because Key West is not a cheap place to live. And so student displacement, transient, that is our biggest issue. As soon as you get a student and you get them good, um, something may happen. The job for mom and dad may close. Um, it just may be cheaper to move on to the mainland and we lose that student. So reviving the program over and over again is key. Lauren, what are the main social issues the Miami Foundation is focused on? How is the foundation working to address them? The Miami Foundation, we've taken a number of different approaches to try and support civic engagement. Um, some of our iconic programs like community grants, which give out about $2 million a year to local nonprofits that are trying to address, again, these critical quality of life issues. Um, but we've also got some more specific programming, uh, programming that ranges from building a more resilient region, which is our collaborative focus with the Resilient 305 Initiative, um, creating a more financially equitable Miami, building prosperity, which is a collective impact effort to create pathways, not only for folks out of poverty, but into living wage jobs that can help them be successful in the long term here in Miami. Um, to our most recent endeavor, Miami Connected, which aims to bridge the digital divide for students across Miami-Dade County who found themselves at a significant disadvantage without stable internet access throughout this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for us, it really is about those regional quality of life issues that involve generally a wide range of stakeholders and create 
exponential impact for neighborhoods and residents and all the folks who call Miami home. The Glades Initiative is another local nonprofit that's been helping connect their rural community by providing a number of resources with the help of volunteers and partnerships. Earlier, we spoke with the initiative's president and CEO, Karis Engel, to learn more. The Glades Initiative is a nonprofit based in the western parts of Palm Beach County. We have very high rates of poverty in the Glades. Um, and of course, we have pockets of poverty all throughout Palm Beach County and all throughout South Florida. The difference with a lot of those areas is that they are within five miles of workplaces or five miles of resources or five miles of middle class or wealthy communities where you get lots of volunteers. And so that's always um, something that creates a bit of a challenge for us. We accomplish our mission best by making sure people know where and how to access services. Since our mission is to improve the coordination and effectiveness of the health and human service delivery system, we did a um, survey a number of years back to try and determine why is it that people didn't access services. And the number one reason was they didn't know about them. Our e-blast, our online newsletter, our website, and our calendar we use as resources to help people know how to find what it is they need and how to engage. Also a great way to find out who's doing what so that if you do want to volunteer, you can get engaged that way as well. Our food program, or we call it food security, it tackles a number of areas and that would be uh, the food distribution that we do every week. It used to be about 50 people. By summer last year, we were up to 350 families. We were processing in and out 17,000 pounds of food. So we would have car lines, 250 cars um, long, and uh, we really grew our program and grew the food that we had access to, um, to be able to do that. And that was with the help of many partners, those who donate the food, those who donate money to purchase food, uh, the food bank, Palm Beach County Food Bank, um, Farm Share, um, and many others who helped us to have that capacity to serve families. We also do home deliveries. We have a number of seniors or other vulnerable residents who get um, a couple bags of groceries delivered to their home each week. We make great efforts to do outreaches throughout the community and we target the areas where our Creole speakers or our Spanish speakers might be, those who have limited English or have limited um, support from family members as well. Those who have children um, talk about needing more childcare opportunities, more activities for the kids. Pretty much everybody mentioned jobs. And that's a historically a challenge in our community. It's, it's not just jobs, but jobs that pay a living wage. Our community is heavily agriculture, so um, this time of year is also challenging because this is off season. So some of our folks migrate up north but those that don't often will have to resort to um, unemployment if they're not able to find some kind of job to sustain them during the off season. We have a recently added program in the last year, we call it economic stability. So those folks that really wanna make a change, they wanna maybe get a better job, get a job or get a better job um, or need some help with um, fixing up the resume or knowing where to look for the job openings. We have a person who will walk them through the process for that and help them. Um, and we've been very successful last year alone. Even with COVID, um, we were able to help um, about 40 families increase uh, their um, income to their household. For us, trying to be out in the community as much as we can, working with folks that are some of um, would have the most difficult time accessing those resources or knowing about those resources, uh, whether for language issues or for not having computer access or, or internet. Um, so yeah, definitely having the information is huge. Um, and we do the best we can to get it out there both digitally and in person because so many folks aren't necessarily on a digital platform. As Karis mentioned in the piece, having a strong network of community partners is key to providing resources and keeping residents informed. Lauren, this is a big part of the Miami Foundation's mission. Talk about the importance of bridging resources and your partners. 
Truly, truly, it, it really is an important piece of the work that we do. Uh, and it's in large part because we know for certain that there is local expertise and existing community trust built all around South Florida and the region at large. And our two other panelists, uh, both Kawana and Robert, are perfect examples of just that. And so for organizations like ours at the Miami Foundation, it's really important to identify those, those trust hubs, those, those places, those organizations, the leaders who have done the on the ground work to gain trust in the neighborhood so that we can best elevate those direct experiences and really utilize those existing communication loops. And so some of what institutions like the Miami Foundation do best is to convene, but an important part of bringing groups together is certainly knowing who to call, right? Who to bring to the table. And supporting and resourcing those trusted community agents is critical. It's a critical piece in prioritizing resident experience. Kiwana, the Conk Republic is a tight-knit community, often cut off from a lot of the mainland services, particularly for children and students. Talk about this issue and how your organization teams up with others in the community to fill that gap. But Tony, you're absolutely right. We are cut off from the benefits of the mainland a lot. And those programs in Miami-Dade and Broward, ooh, I wish I could have some of those resources in my pocket. We would surely benefit. However, we have some wonderful, wonderful local partners with Horace O'Brien School, United Way of Collier and the Keys, and the SOS Foundation, Foss Murphy Foundation, these people put everything into us and keep us going. We serve over 200 students with free music lessons, free of charge. And it would be such a shame to lose that benefit because music is your outlet, music is your freedom, music is, music is your voice when you have no other. And so they help us keep that alive. And if I could only partner with someone from the mainland, that would be wonderful. I would take the opportunity in a heartbeat to make sure that we can grow because not only are we detached from the mainland, but we are a small, we have a very small location. And so in our two to three, because my office becomes a classroom sometimes, <laughs> we are able to serve. And you know, with the expansion and more resources, I think we can grow and grow and grow. And that is the goal. So definitely, definitely want to um, continue our partnerships and add others. Anyone in the mainland, you know, Lauren, I'm, I'm willing. I am willing and able, and we sure will take some of those resources if you think about us down here at the Keys. <laughs> but for the most part, um, our community does not let us down. They come in in full force, and they help us out, and they're, we're able to continue with summer programs, and again, free lessons, and we're expanding into other programs as well. Robert, tell us about some of the community partners the Pride Center works closely with and how that helps with your mission. Sure. Well, sorry, Kawana, but we're very fortunate. Uh, the Pride Center at Equality Park, we purchased a five and a half acre campus uh, 10 years ago. And so we have 35,000 square feet of meeting and office space. And it's actually the home of 10 other organizations. And so our whole intent was to build this community of care, providing multiple services, multiple organizations, so that we could all come together. And then in our meeting room space, we have uh, over 60 groups and organizations that utilize that meeting room space on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. Pre-COVID, we had one to 2,000 people step foot on our, bit, uh, our campus. And uh, we just opened up today for the very first day of, of opening back up to the public. Um, otherwise, we were only providing HIV services, HIV testing by appointment only. But then during the pandemic, we also, after a seven year dream, we collaborated with CAR4. CAR4 is the state of Florida's largest nonprofit developer. And we actually received funding through Florida Housing and built a 48 apartment community right on our campus for the LGBT seniors providing safety net linkage of services and specialized programs just for the LGBT uh, active ager program and our allies here in uh, South Florida. 
The value of volunteers is undeniable when it comes to building strong communities. This last question is for everyone. How essential are volunteers to your organizations? And what's the easiest way for people to get involved? Kawana, we'll start with you. Well, one of the main things, our students that we teach, they come back and give back and start to teach as well. So that's one of the major ways. Bring your kids back. Let them give what they've learned. That's an awesome way. A second way for the community is to join our mailing list and you can see everything that we we have going on, whether it's a new program, whether it's a fundraising event, no matter what that is, you are always welcome to join us and be a part. Even if during our summer camp, like we have going on right now, we welcome the help. Come help us, you know, chaperone a field trip, and um, even sit in on a choir class, sit in on a ukulele class, anything that you are willing to do and donate to your time to the children, we would appreciate it with all of our hearts. Volunteers are critical to civic engagement and the best way that folks can get involved is really to find an issue that you care about. Find the issue that you care about most and just take a first step there. You can read and support your local newspapers, um, plug into local news outlets. You can talk to your neighbor, talk to folks who live nearby and, you know, folks who already trust you and have, have already created that communication loop with you, your family, your colleagues, and then you can volunteer, join an organization. And if you're really committed to some of these issues, you can find ways to perhaps join a board, donate or volunteer your time. Um, but really volunteers are the linchpin in so much of the good civic engagement work that happens in this region. Thanks, Lauren. Oh, we have a Facebook question from Nick in Plantation. How can local leaders help get people engaged? The local leaders here in QS, again, like you were saying, because we are so close knit and it is so small, they have gone above and beyond what needs to be done. We are in the paper, we are on the radio, they have any kind of photo ops, the city is actually um, helping us expand. Um, so, at this point, for for us in Bahama Village Music Program, the city is doing everything that we asked for, and our local leaders are really championing for us to continue to keep going. I'd actually love to build off of something that Kawana just mentioned. Um, you know, engaging lots of different folks through either radio or different communication methods. For us here in Miami, we have a largely trilingual resident base, and so. For us, when we're putting out communications and resources, making sure that we are doing it not only in English, but also in Spanish and Haitian Creole, um, making sure that you're providing the right resources through the right methods for the folks that you're looking to reach is actually a, an incredible way and a really important way to make sure that leaders are reaching those who they're trying to prioritize. You can watch the full town hall on our Facebook page at your South FL. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.